I hope you got a bit out of section one um, and, and now you feel comfortable that it's definitely justifiable to get a, a guidance system for your farm. I guess the next part, which is part two, we're going to talk a little bit about what are some of the technical issues. So can this base station talk to another base station, for example, or can one, one tractor system work with another tractor system? They're sort of common questions we get all the time from farmers about uh, communication between these things. And also I'm going to talk a lot about manufacturers' um, accuracy claims and how those claims are, and statements are made up so that you've got a clear understanding about you know, the, the, the accuracy of, of the system that you buy. I'm also going to start just talking some, about some of the potential problems that you'll, you might see with your guidance system. So let's now launch in and have a look at some of those slides. I'm going to talk about accuracy. This is where the salesmen tend to bluff people a fair bit. Where the accuracy is calculated basically on a plus or minus. So what they do is sit the receiver in one spot and log its position continuously for a period of 24 hours. So it's seeing how accurate, even though the receiver is not moving, how accurate it's telling it it is. And so you'll get these sort of, um, you'll get a whole heap of of points in here, you get some out here, and then you get the odd one that flips out here like that, see? And so that's how they quote the accuracy. So John Deere on their website says plus or minus one inch. So that's, so really that's two inches, isn't it? <laughs> plus or minus an inch. Two thirds of the time, or 68% of the time, which is sigma one, within six miles of a base. So that's how they quote their accuracy. Trimble, say less than one inch, and they... Trimble saying, this is what they put on their website, Sigma 2. Now, who in the right mind would know what Sigma 2 means? It just, it's just marketing, you know. And then Leica have said plus or minus 5 centimetres 99% of the time, which is actually Sigma 3, within 6.5 kilometres of a base. So they've all quoted RTK systems, but they've all quoted them differently, just to really confuse the hell out of you. But what Sigma is, is actually how much data. So if that was the exactly where the receiver was, how much of that information, two thirds of that information or 68% is within that range and then 95 and 99%. So it's just how confident they are in, in those numbers. Does that make sense? They're all RTK but <coughs> yeah, two thirds or one third of that data is going to be outside of that two centimetre range and who knows where it could be. But generally it won't be too far away. And it's interesting, this is straight off John Deere's website. Um, if you look at the Starfire or the accuracy ratings up here, they've got RTK sub inches where I got that number from before, but also Starfire 2 plus or minus 4 inches. And I have a lot of people say to me, oh, I don't really need anything more than 100 mils, 10 centimetres, that's good enough for me. But when you read the fine print down the bottom here, you'll see that it says in where the two stars are here, 15 minutes pass to pass accuracy, only 95% of the time. So 5% of that in that 15 minute window is going to be beyond 10 centimetres for a start, plus or minus 4 inch, plus or minus 4 inch, and that's only in a 15 minute window. So what you're exactly what you're saying before, I can drive a beautiful straight line, but it come back the next run and it's off. Well, that's exactly what's happening. It's satellite drift, and the differential corrections don't account as well for that as the real-time kinematic or the RTK system. So be very careful how you read your marketing materials, but hopefully if you refer back to what I've given you, you might be able to make a bit of sense of it. The thing is that's static receiver accuracy. Right? That's putting a, a, a receiver, sitting it there for 24 hours and logging its points. What happens when we put it on a tractor three metres above the ground for a start? We've got implement factors, we've got the soil conditions, we've got how well the vehicle set up, how well the thing's tuned, and it's rocking and rolling. We've got all these other factors now, and people wonder why I can't get two centimetres coming out the back here. Well, there's so many other factors. The biggest causal factor of all problems in the tractor is the guy sitting in the seat. Right? He's the one that creates most problems, i found. Because he's stuffed around with the settings, or he's changed the AB line, or he's got into an area he shouldn't have got into, and or he's played around with the steering settings and steering like a dog. So you really got to, um, yeah, there's so many things that can go wrong in here. Um, 
yeah, there's a combination of those factors. But to diagnose problems, you really need to understand how the system works first. Can I talk to other base stations? People ask us, can I, you know, my neighbour's got Trimble and I want to use John Deere. No. Nope. They've done so much to confuse the hell out of us. Um, manufacturers put proprietary communication formats. That's the number one thing they do. So it's a bit like me talking to you in Japanese. Um, radio differences. So one company might use one particular type of radio, like a UHF spread spectrum, the other one might use a VHF. The other thing what they do in the spread spectrum radios, which is what you buy on most systems nowadays, they'll hop, hop between frequencies differently. So even if one system has the same radio, they make it deliberate so you can't find out what the other one's hopping frequencies are. They'll also have authorization codes a lot of the times that you have to be logged in to that system. The other big one, and this is what irks me the most, is, is support. So they'll say, oh, you know, you've got a Trimble base, but you're talking on a top con on a tractor. Oh, well, it must be the Trimble's problem, and it's not our problem. And of course, Trimble will say it's Topcon's problem, and so, you know, might be you might have one system plugged into a John Deere, and then John Deere say, no, it's not our problem, it's their problem, and then they say it's not their problem, and all of a sudden you've got just a mess, haven't you? So, as much as I hate to say it, you should really stick with the company uh, and they've done it deliberately to make sure that you stay within green or red or yellow or purple or whatever colour you might be ch choosing. We've tried very hard over the years and uh, you know, companies like Auto Farm have done very well out of being non-colour bound, but I'm sure there's been lots of problems where the tractor company says it's not their problem and the, the G GPS company says it's not their problem. Like I mentioned, there's several different types of radios. There's a UHF high-powered one that FarmScan uses. Uh, it's 35 watt, so you can really punch through trees. You know, it, it's very powerful. And if you do have a tree problem, I'd recommend going up to a high, high-powered radios. They operate in the 300 to 3,000 megahertz range. There's the UHF spread spectrum, which almost all these companies come out with now, like a John Deere Trimble Auto Farm should be in there. Sorry, I didn't put Auto Farm. They use one watt spread spectrum radios. And it's because it doesn't clutter up one part of the spectrum. Um, they, they, they hop between frequencies so it doesn't clog one up. Whereas this one here, like this and this, they actually clog up one particular frequency. So you might be licensed to 487.21 megahertz or 25 megahertz. And that's your frequency. So you have to license that. Whereas with these, these don't have to be licensed. And they operate around 900. Some operate 450, but 900 megahertz in the UHF range. Trimble have been very, very um, busy putting in lots of these VHF ones. They reckon they can go better around obstacles and trees and things. Operate much lower frequencies, 300 to down to 30 megahertz. 50 watt radio, so really, really got lots of high power. Uh, take Chinchilla, for example. There's like one base station with about 30 people on it they've got really high powered radios and they're punching out a long way. Networked RTK. Typical range is from 6 to 25 k's. If you get a company that tells you they can do 40 and 50 k's and just don't believe it, they say it, it might get out that far but your accuracy is going to be pretty bad. Um, if you look on the marketing literature you'll see one part per million. Has anyone seen that? Probably not read it that closely. What that means is basically one millimetre per kilometre so every, every kilometre you go from the base station, you're another millimetre out. So after 30 kilometres, you're another 30 millimetres on top of our original accuracy. So 25 mils plus 30 millimetres, so all of a sudden they're 55 millimetres plus or minus. So you see, see how that can, you can start blowing out. <coughs> can you see some potential problems with this, with this installation of a base station? Yeah, we get this thing called multipath, where we'll potentially get the signal bouncing off metallic surfaces, even trees. It can bounce off trees, like waxy coating on the leaves. Um, it will go through plastic, but it won't go through metal, and that's the satellite signal coming in. And what it does is it gets a bit confused that I'm getting two signals, I'm not sure where I'm going to be. It's interesting, I did, did some testing recently under power lines, and, and we couldn't get it to do this. We tried to get it to multipath, but it wouldn't do it right up against power the big towers. Um, 
but yeah, it definitely is a problem. The other thing is this guy hasn't put the radio aerial up very high. So coming off the shed roof, it's going to really impact anything operating out to the left here. And also there's a tree on this side here that is really going to have trouble punching through because the, the antenna is just not high enough. Yeah, you can put a ground plane in. Um, uh, look at Auto Farm, they have a big metal disc and stick, stick the receiver on that, stop the bounce coming up underneath. Here, this, this one's got a, a ground plane in it and we put it up a metre up above the roof just to stop that reflection. Um, GP, the GPS obviously doesn't need to be high. It just needs to have a clear view of the sky, right? Because it's just picking up satellite signals. But if you put it down beside the shed, you're going to lose half your satellites. So that's why most people put it up on a shed. And then you can see in the background there where the UHF antenna goes up. It goes up on a 9 metre tower and we're putting a 6 dB gain aerial on it to try and punch it out as far as we can. It, it'll go out to 15 k's like that. So that's, yeah, that's sort of both, sort of, it's important to get the base station installation right.